Um, if I may, I would like to address my first question to Mr. Borfield and Wiesenon. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Broadband Plan outlines recommendations on how the federal government uh, can utilize broadband. It seems to us that it will require uh, a, a public-private partnership. Can you talk to us about the role that small businesses uh, will play in ensuring governments harness the power of broadband? <clears throat> um, thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I mean, I think the, uh, as, I, as I laid out in my an initial testimony, um, and as uh, Mr. Wisenden addressed, um, you know, the power of broadband to impact the way that government operates, uh, a government 2.0 revolution, if you will, that allows um, the representatives in this room to connect in a much more direct and meaningful way to citizens, allows citizens to connect to the actual data and underlying information that tells them what their government is actually doing. You know, I believe that's critically important to our, <clears throat> to our government, uh, to democracy in this country. Um, and I think it's, it's driven by, um, you know, cheap, pervasive, affordable access to, to broadband, wherever you happen to be in this country. In terms of the roles of small business in driving this government 2.0 revolution, um, I, I believe it's, it's very, very critical that there is an open playing field for small businesses to access and drive this kind of innovation. Um, the, uh, you know, there is a, a natural tendency for large entrenched businesses to want to shape the playing field in a way that um, dictates disruptive innovation on their timeline and on their terms. Um, you know, broadband affords access for small businesses to come in and drive innovation and in government at a much more rapid pace and in a much more meaningful way. Um, and I think that, you know, any, any policies that support making that access as open as possible to small businesses is going to be good for citizens, good for small businesses, and good for our economy and democracy. Do you see any barriers uh, preventing small businesses from getting contracts in this arena? Well, obviously, from my perspective, we were able to win um, a pretty meaningful and substantial mm -hmm. contract to, to implement, for example, recovery.gov. Um, you know, with that said, the way that um, contracting with the government is often set up, a lot of those opportunities don't end up becoming available for full and open competition. Um, Recovery.gov was a situation where Congress had dictated that the platform had to be implemented very quickly with some very aggressive requirements, and the administration felt that they needed to go out and find the most innovative, best companies out there possible, and it was, in fact, an open competition. We had one week to respond to it. Um, that's not always the case. A lot of these systems are, are ending up going to the entrenched incumbent contractors, which are often large businesses, um, that have little incentive to offer the kind of highly innovative approaches that, that we provided with recovery.gov. Mr. Wisdom. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I, I think we could use some overhaul. I, I, I feel as a small business distinctly disadvantaged uh, in the purchasing process, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because it's so burdensome. And I, and I don't think it's necessary as much as it probably used to be. Um, on the open government, making sure that government is using it, I, I think um, the technology, <clears throat> excuse me, is, go is going to invite um, people to organize better and more innovation to come out of that. And, and I think uh, it's really a question of political leadership more than it is of technical capability. I think uh, the administration certainly has been pushing for government to leverage these networks and to use use broadband and other technologies in innovative ways. I think there's an opportunity for legislative leadership as well, and there's, there's plenty, of, pl plenty of ground to cover that would benefit both government and small business. Thank you. Mr. Masseray, last week the FCC announced a new framework to preserve an open Internet. In your opinion, what will, be, what will the preservation of an open Internet mean for the growth of the green technology startups uh, that you work with? That one worked, yes. Yes, you can hear me now. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, and it's an interesting one. The framework itself represents um, a, a difference, I guess, in understanding about what the FCC can regulate. And that specifically opens up the doors for a change. And so it will be interesting to see how that, how that can work. The Internet essentially is two parts. And from our perspective, there's the ability to communicate over the Internet, which is the connection, if you will. And then there's the content. And so these two things are, are partly uh, a part of that challenge. From our perspective, the most important thing is the ability to have connective 
uh, connections, if you will, between any one of our offices, between any one of our employees, and this, this applies globally. So from our perspective, that's the most important thing. To make it really simple is if, if you look at each one of our employees as a virtual point of access on the net, each one of those have a, a broadband provider, and each one of those providers generally provide a similar platform. But if they don't, if it's unique, and if, if there's uniquely different things uh, that don't share commonality between them, it means that essentially we'd no longer be able to use some of the tools we use. So imagine if we couldn't use Skype, which is a telecommunications technology that acts like a phone. It's vitally important for some of our members to be able to use Skype to communicate. And if their broadband provider were limiting those functions, that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. So our greatest interest is in maintaining and having access to a common set of connectivity. And the content itself isn't, isn't meant to be part of that challenge, but I can understand how the FCC is facing that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McDonald, I represent New York. And coming from New York, I am very much um, concerned about improving emergency communication with uh, first responders. Uh, and you spoke about that and uh, the services that you provide through your company. Uh, and so, as we know, first responders have traditionally relied on blue, uh, paper blueprints yes. to navigate a building. And uh, you say how important it is to move uh, this information to the Internet. And, and we all know that it really enhanced public safety. My concern or my question is how do you balance these benefits uh, with ensuring that web-based uh, data is kept safe and secure? Excellent question and one that we face every day. Uh, let me start by saying, uh, yes, we do rely heavily on the Internet and access for that uh, for, for a variety of reasons, uh, w which I'll, I'll speak to in a moment. We, uh, for, first of all, let's be clear. I know students who've been able to crack almost into the Pentagon, so I am not going to tell you that mm -hmm. they can't get into almost anything. Having said that, we put countless amount of time and energy and resources into ensuring the security of our system. And uh, the, the other thing, based on the way we have set up our network and accessibility, is obviously there's extreme redundancy to what we do. It's backed up, it's supported, it's password protected, and so forth, and there are firewalls and other kinds of, uh, of safety systems built into what we do. Uh, I also will tell you that most police departments still do rely on paper and CD-ROM. Fact of the matter is, we provide it in paper and CD-ROM. But, but as soon as you publish a paper product that's in the hands of a first responder, and the person who's managing that facility's cell phone number changes, that information is now outdated, and that lack of clarity in the information you have in front of you could be the difference in responding effectively or not. And so you need, a, like everything in life, you need a balance. Mm -hmm. And in here you need a balance of the three, you know, low-tech, mid-tech, and high-tech. Broadband brings the high-tech capability to what we do. It's vitally important because what happens now is if your cell phone number changes, that is updated immediately and, is, and the system already and immediately generates an email to all people in the system who have access, keeping them posted on any changes. So vital information, timely information is important. Thank you. Uh, 